Love and Death by Max Wallace and Ian Halperin Read by Media Gitao Introduction Within days of the release of our first book, Who Killed Kurt Cobain, in April 1998, the letters, calls, and emails began to pour in. Most of them demanded to know the same thing. Why hadn't we answered the question posed by the book's title? The seeds of our initial investigation had been planted in 1994, shortly after Cobain's death, when Ian Halperin was on a West Coast tour with his band, State of Emergency. A former member of the band had moved to Seattle a year earlier and formed relationships with a number of people in Cobain's circle, including one of Kurt's drug dealers and his best friend, Dylan Carlson. When Ian arrived in Seattle, his old bandmate introduced him to a number of Seattle scenesters, including friends of Kurt, each of whom related their doubts about the official story. Even then, soon after the apparent suicide, there was a feeling in Seattle that Kurt's death may not have come at his own hand. Ian, who had met Kurt in 1990 before a Nirvana gig in Montreal, didn't give much thought to the claims until he heard that a private detective hired by Courtney Love was claiming that Kurt had been murdered and that Courtney may have been involved. When he returned to Canada, Ian contacted his old writing partner, Max Wallace, who was then station manager of North America's oldest alternative radio station, KCCU-FM, and had solid connections in alternative music circles. A decade earlier, we had shared a Rolling Stone magazine award for investigative journalism. We decided to embark on our own minor investigation into the circumstances of Cobain's death, and came out with a somewhat skeptical treatment in the June 1995 issue of Canadian Disc magazine. On the strength of the article, we were commissioned to produce a video documentary about the murder theory, and a few months later we traveled to Seattle and California to investigate the case. But while we were conducting our own probe, the murder theory was taking on an unstoppable momentum of its own. Courtney Love's private detective, Tom Grant, had gone public with his murder theory in numerous national and international media forums, including a major U.S. network television show. Before long, our documentary had turned into a hastily assembled book published on the fourth anniversary of Kurt's death. Instead of taking a stand on Grant's charges, our book examined the facts on both sides and in the end simply called on police to reopen the investigation. Some reviewers some reviewers mocked the conspiracy theory at the core of our book, but most praised its objectivity. The New Yorker issued us an imprimatur of credibility when it labeled the book a, quote, judicious presentation of explosive material, end quote. Some readers, however, seemed to believe we had been a little too judicious. Among the myriad of letters we received following the book's release were a number from forensic and law enforcement specialists who told us that we had missed the boat. The details we reported clearly demonstrated that Kurt Cobain had been murdered. But by then the case was over for us. Max wrote two more books on unrelated subjects, appeared as a guest columnist for the Sunday New York Times, and produced two documentary films. Ian wrote three books, was hired as a correspondent for Court TV, and embarked on an acting career that landed him a role as Howard Hughes's friend in Martin Scorsese's upcoming film, The Aviator. Meanwhile, another high-profile case was making its way back into the headlines. A month after the publication of Who Killed Kurt Cobain, former LAPD detective Mark Furman published Murder in Greenwich, exploring the 1975 murder of 15-year-old Martha Moxley, a book that regularly jockeyed for first place with ours on Ingram's true crime bestseller list. Furman had pointed to Kennedy cousin Michael Skakel as the likely killer, and when the case was reopened after 27 years, Murder in Greenwich was credited. On June 7, 2002, Skakel was convicted of the crime. For Furman, a crucial piece of new evidence had, re had surfaced two decades after Martha Moxley's death. Nearly a decade after Kurt Cobain's, we came into some damning new evidence of our own. Welcome back to Media Gitao. So, I'll just get the Merry Christmas out of the way. 
because love and death um, is not such warm holiday cocoa mix and hearthstone fire jingly jangly feelings. Love and death is that. All right. So as I was reading the, the end of this here, I'm thinking they came into some damning new evidence of their own and decided to reopen the case. Um, not reopen the case, but, you know, continue with their investigation and write this book in the same way that I did eight to ten videos on Kurt Cobain using Montage of Heck by Brett Morgan, as well as Heavier Than Heaven by Charles Cross to examine his life while adding my own commentary, as I'm going to do here, as I'm doing at this exact moment. Um, but I miss the boat. You know, I hadn't, I, I read this book like five years ago. And I was very skeptical, as you are right now. But you can see how well-written this book is. They're just presenting... The thing about the Cobain case and his death that makes it possibly a murder is these weird circumstances surrounding it. If these hadn't happened, and obviously we'll get to these, such as the 225 milligrams of heroin... Just the way the suicide went down with, well, okay, specifically the shotgun um, and how the cartridge fell on the wrong side. All these things, as Wallace and Halperin will present to you, um, all that stuff makes it a weird case. If you take all that away, okay, you have a suicide note that says, I'm killing myself because fuck this, I've always wanted to do this. And you did a handwriting analysis and it was in his handwriting and the suicide itself was like just a straight overdose of the 225 milligrams, um, or it was just, you know, the shotgun one, then you could say, well, this was most likely a suicide. Excuse me. But all this other weird stuff, people coming out of the woodwork like El Duce and Alan Wrench, everything you see in Kurt and Courtney, and I'm not going to reiterate all these things because if you've come this far, you're quite familiar with the case. Hopefully you're as obsessed with it as I am. Now, I am not a, I don't know, a bloodlusty murder porn type person. I'm not really into death because I have a morbid fascination. Um, at the core of myself, I'm afraid to die in some ways, just like you guys are. That's why we don't think about it for that long, you know? It's a bummer, especially around the holidays. But <laughs> what we're going to do is examine these facts because they are facts, okay? Such as the handwriting at the bottom of the note is just real wacky. <laughs> That's a fact. <laughs> no, it's a good thing we're using love and death as our source because, um, you know, I've been watching YouTube videos about the case, but that's just what they are. They're YouTube videos. This is a well-written and sourced book. And so we're going to look at that. Now, what is your what is your point here? We're reopening it in the same ways that Wallace and Halperin are because we're not satisfied, ladies and gentlemen. We are not satisfied with this idea that Kurt Cobain killed himself, even though we've been hearing it since we were kids or teenagers or in our 20s, just for a long time. Oh, he killed himself. Oh, bummer. Yeah, kind of saw it coming. He seemed angsty. I liked his music. But wait, weren't Nirvana really popular? Like, really popular? Didn't they just do Unplugged a few months before? Weren't they on tour for In Utero? Basically, yes, Kurt was depressed. It's because he was realizing his wife was a cunt. A cheating, manipulative cunt. And uh, But he was on his way to recovery from this. He was starting to see a new life without her. So he wasn't going to kill himself at that point. Okay, he was seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, and he had friends that were helping him see that. But don't take it from me. Take it from love and death. Chapter 1 It is a typically rainy day in Montesana, Washington, when we arrive for our interview with Kurt's paternal grandfather, Leland Cobain, in June 2003. Leland and his late wife Iris were said to have been closer to Kurt than even his own parents, and there were reports that shortly before his death, Kurt had made plans to go on a fishing trip with his grandfather. Although we had contacted him while we were researching our first book, Leland, like most of Kurt's immediate family, was reluctant to be interviewed. 
Now, more than nine years after Kurt's death, we had heard that Leland was finally ready to talk about his famous grandson. Most biographical accounts of Kurt's early years describe his family living in a trailer park, conjuring up images of a trailer trash upbringing. Indeed, the small Montesano lot where Leland resides, and where Kurt had lived on and off during his youth, is officially given this designation in the town directory, and perhaps it once served this purpose. But when we arrive, we are surprised to find that the dwellings aren't trailers at all, but rather small, prefab, bungalow-style units with well-groomed lawns and beautiful trees. Boats and golf carts are parked in many of the driveways, suggesting a more affluent community than what we have been led to expect by the condescending biographies and press accounts. Leland greets us warmly at the door of his slightly cramped two-bedroom house. He and Iris had moved in more than 30 years earlier, when Kurt was just a young child, and Leland had continued living here alone after Iris' death in 1997. Just a stone's throw away is the house where Kurt himself had lived briefly with his father after his parents' divorce. When the going got rough, however, it was his grandparents' house where he sought refuge. It wouldn't be entirely accurate to describe the house as a shrine to Kurt, but from the moment we walk in the door, his presence can be seen and felt everywhere. The first sight that catches one's eye is a framed gold record presented to Nirvana in 1993. Underneath it is a kitschy black velvet portrait of Kurt given to Leland a few years ago by a fan. The rest of the walls and bookshelves are crammed with photos of Kurt and the other grandchildren, sandwiched in between plaques and trophies commemorating Leland's achievements as a champion golfer and dartsman. More Kurt-related memorabilia is crammed in the basement, including hundreds of photos and letters sent to Leland and Iris by Nirvana fans from all over the world. I'm very proud of him says Leland, tearing up slightly as he pauses in front of a photo of a cherubic three-year-old Kurt. He was a good kid. I miss him. He takes us on a tour of the house, pointing out the many artifacts associated with his grandson and telling stories about the boy who had spent a lot of time within these walls. Leland is a spry 79-year-old who wears hearing aids in both ears to remedy a deafness acquired while fighting at Guadalcanal as a young marine during the Second World War, and then exacerbated by rolling asphalt for a, a living years later. After his discharge from the re- Marines, he developed a serious alcohol problem, <clears throat> which he admits made him a different person. By most accounts, his problem started after his father, a local county sheriff, was killed when his gun went off accidentally. However, his heaviest drinking reportedly started after his third son, a severely retarded boy named Michael, died in an institution at the age of six. Leland, though, soon conquered his personal demons, found religion, and gave up alcohol completely. I became a changed man, he recalls. By the time Kurt was born in 1967, he had become a respected citizen of Montesano, a regular churchgoer, and by most accounts a pretty good father and grandfather, frequently babysitting Kurt and his younger sister Kim. But it was Iris, not Leland, with whom Kurt was most closely bonded. They were so much alike, Leland recalls, pointing to a photo of a strikingly beautiful brunette taken just after the couple were married. Kurt loved his grandmother so much. I think she was the only member of the family who he could confide in. I think he was closer to Iris than he was to his own mother. He got his artistic side from Iris, that's sure. Leland takes out a box of drawings Kurt did as a child. One of them, signed Kurt Cobain, age six, depicts Donald Duck and shows undeniable artistic talent for one so young. When I saw that one, I said to Kurt, You traced that, you didn't draw it. And he got mad. He said to me, I did too draw it. After Kurt left his hometown for good in 1987, he kept in touch with his grandparents only sporadically. Leland takes out a Christmas card they received after Kurt moved away. Dear long-lost grandparents, I miss you very much. Which is no excuse for my not visiting. We put out a single just recently, and it is sold out already. I'm happier than I have ever been. It would be nice to hear from you as well. Merry Christmas. Love, Kurt. 
Leland hadn't read our first book, and we had to tell him the subject of this new one. After a tour of the house and an hour's worth of anecdotes about Kurt and his family while sitting around the dining room table, we are at last prepared to broach the topic. Oop, oh, stuck pages. <laughs> We are at last prepared to broach the topic we thought would be the most difficult to bring up. Two of Leland's brothers had killed themselves years earlier, fueling the most common of all the clichés about Kurt's own fate, that he had somehow inherited the suicide gene. It is obviously a sensitive subject, and Leland's voice chokes when he talks about the family tragedies. Finally, we ask him how he and Iris felt when they learned their own grandson had killed himself. His response is not at all what we expected. Kurt didn't commit suicide, he declares matter-of-factly. He was murdered. I'm sure of it. All right, so... Um, always nice to hear Kurt's... Christmas letter to his grandparents, probably around 1987, 1988. Gosh, you guys, I am looking out my window, and I've got uh, just a real slow snowfall, just barely flaking, and uh, I do feel the warmness of the heart reading this book to you guys. There's something about, instead of <laughs> instead of ranting about social issues and, like, I don't know, getting mad at the world, which there's a lot to get mad about. We can just read a book together and live in the past and solve one of our unsolved mysteries. Which, by the way, didn't that show freak you guys out as a kid or even a teenager? Even now, try watching it. Go watch some old Robert Stack episodes of Unsolved Mysteries. Here, let me mute this. Um, <clears throat> check, check, one, two, three. Okay. Yeah, go watch one of those. Let me let me turn this up a bit too, you guys. Whoops, sorry. Mita Gita, why are you messing with a good thing? All right, all right, sorry. Anyway, Unsolved Mysteries is scary. Robert Stack is scary because one day, and then they never saw him again. The one thing we do know about the case is that she was stabbed in the face and then beaten and raped. And that's all we know until new evidence. I don't know. Robert Stack always really freaked me out. He's scary. Now, who did they, who did they get? Dennis Farina to do it? Now he's dead too? I'm sensing a conspiracy theory here, guys. Everyone who hosts Unsolved Mysteries dies. <laughs> um, so, what I'm trying to do... Yeah, I got distracted, of course, by the beautiful snowdrift outside. It really does feel like Christmas, you know. I told you guys, <clears throat> and I'm really going to take my time, too, um, with the holiday spirit. I've got my coffee here, and we're going to take our time while staying on track. Don't you worry. This, I plan to do this whole book, family, all right? So we're talking <coughs> 16 to 20 videos or something. We're talking a long time. It's going to get us into spring. Now, you know me, though. What did I start? Deliverance? Never finished that one. Uh, Elliot Smith, Torment Saint. Yes, the, the problem is I kind of feel like I got duped. I put in all this time with Heavier Than Heaven, which does have a lot of facts. It has a lot of truths about Kurt's life and Kurt's personality. But as Wallace and Halperin just stated, this tired cliche of Kurt as the suicidal, depressed, hating life. He didn't like that image of himself, and he didn't feel that he aligned with that. That wasn't him. That was the media's image. Now, he certainly contributed to it by writing songs about dark things, because that's what you write songs about, is dark things. Okay, That's how you deal with the pain. That's how you deal with it and feel alive. You turn it into art so you can share it with other people and then have them feel less alone. And then you become rich and popular, which is maybe something that you didn't want. Okay. But he was still making music. Anyway, now you're getting way off topic here. Um, I am going to do this whole book, and I felt that I was duped in retrospect in the same ways that surely... 
the authors here, felt duped by the mainstream narrative, the widely and very quickly accepted narrative that Kurt Cobain was depressed and suicidal, and his suicide was an inevitability. Okay, just look at his songs. They talk about death. That means he killed himself. Well, then all artists everywhere would have killed themselves. Artists talk about death. If you're not talking about death, you're not doing it right. It's one of the most important things to examine. The Buddhists say to die before you die. The Buddhists don't say to kill yourself. So one of the reasons that I am reticent to talk about Torment Saint and Elliot Smith is because I am concerned that when I read it again, it's going to talk about how... Let me turn this up just slightly. It's going to talk about how Elliot uh, was just massively suicidal, always wanted to kill himself, and then did. Well, I mean, I don't think that Elliot Smith was murdered. I don't. But his death also has a lot of weird circumstances. His life was just getting better at the time that he killed himself. Now, I think just to... I don't know. Because I, I, pro I may not continue Elliot Smith. It, just, it honestly depends on... Now i got to turn it down again. It honestly depends on what you guys want. This channel is so small. But um, I've got some free time lately. And so leave a comment. I'll just do the, you know, if you like this video, it really does help me out if you hit the thumbs up. It, it at least warms my little holiday heart, okay? And I will say <clears throat> these audiobooks are my favorite thing to do. It feels right. At least there's some kind of content. You get stuck, you're rambling too much, Mirijita. Okay, I'm sorry. Let's continue reading the book. Now, Love and Death, I'm sure... You know, these audiobooks are available for you by people who will not constantly interrupt and comment on the content. But that's exactly the fun of this. You get the text, then you get my opinion, and what I'd like you to do is leave a comment. Do you like this series? Do you want to... I mean, I'm probably going to keep doing this whether you like it or not. But do you like it? Do you want to hear more? Do you want me to go back to Elliot Smith? Do you want me to finish up Deliverance? Do you appreciate the... <coughs> excuse me. Do you appreciate the social commentary more? One series I was doing, excuse that spike, was Uncultured. Um, it's an interesting idea I had, if I may say so, that you just talk about, I don't know, the social issues of the last week or two, the latest deaths, the latest Me Too accusations, the women throughout history who uh, have fucked it up. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> So I'm going to do this whole book, whether you like it or not, but your feedback means a lot to me. Um, I've, I've accepted my unpopularity. Some of you guys come in and you say, oh, it's a good thing you're unpopular. You suck. You hate women. You deserve to be unpopular. Um, one, <clears throat> excuse me. One comment I got recently, which has inspired me to actually use the microphone and do a decent video for you guys here, was I think Lisa saying, hey, I can't hear you. All right. And that is an issue, and I do apologize for all the phone videos. Anytime you have some kind of spike where I go, hey, hey, hey right, um, it does a, a thing because there's no pop filter, just like when you hit the pop. All right. There's no filter on your phone, so it, it immediately makes everything you said after disappear into the wind. And when I listen to the videos for review, it's like my most important points are always after the pop. So I'll be like, you know the the... The the secret to life is, you guys... <laughs> it's really annoying, so I do apologize. The reason for the phone videos is that I haven't had the time to do this kind of thing. And this is going to be a long one, all right? Hopefully you're just using me to do your dishes. That is the point of these videos, is to entertain you and educate you. And I do hope you feel both, all right? Because, uh, yeah, like I said, I don't know. It puts me in a good mood. Okay, fine, me to g and get back to the content. We're not in a good mood. Now you're just uh, talking about all sorts of shit. All right, all right, that's fine. So I am going to do this whole book. 
Um, the reason I don't want to finish Torment Saint is because I think that it's biased. And that guy's writing style is really flourishy. It's like he writes like a freaking senior year, you know, English student. I don't know. I don't know. So, uh, yeah, Merry Christmas. In the days and weeks following Kurt Cobain's 1994 death, journalists and biographers descended on his hometown of Aberdeen, Washington, seeking clues to help make sense of the suicide of the town's most famous descendant, a town Kurt had constantly scorned in his music, his interviews, and his journals. So glaring was Aberdeen's sense of hopelessness that many came away feeling Kurt's eventual fate was hardly surprising, was perhaps even inevitable. I am... I'm really going to try to avoid interrupting like this so early during this audiobook, but that's exactly what I just said. All right. What do they say here? So glaring was Aberdeen's sense of hopelessness that many came away feeling Kurt's eventual fate was hardly surprising, was perhaps even inevitable. Well, there's no inevitable suicide, you guys. No one is born to die. There is no such thing as the angsty artist who um, their life was fated for death since the beginning. You, you know, Tupac? No, he chose that life and his fucking stupid Black Panther mother. Tupac was in the Black Panthers since he was a teenager. Tupac is one of these other... Maybe I'll do a video on him at some point. But one of these other guys worshipped because he died, because uh, he was killed, which he deserved because he beat up that other dude in Vegas beforehand, as well as all of his political fucking baiting during his entire rap career and i can summarize tupac's rap style with like that's tupac that's all of his stuff he had absolutely no flow no style no delivery it was the same shit he had no different styles you guys it was the same fucking rhyming pattern all right not to say some of those songs aren't good they are Tupac's the most overrated rapper in the history of rap and hip-hop. Bar none. That's just a side note for you. Um, so Tupac wasn't slated to die, nor was Kurt Cobain, nor has anybody ever been in the history of humanity. We are born to live. That is your, that is your mission, is to live and to help others. Kurt would have lived. He wanted to live. Why do you think he went down to rehab towards the end of his life? Sure, everyone was threatening him and stuff, but he did it of his own volition. Now, he also left of his own volition. That is an undisputed fact. He left rehab by climbing that wall and stuff. So, <clears throat> I don't know. It's fucking annoying. <clears throat> the suicide rate in Aberdeen is twice the national average, and the unemployment rate staggering since the near collapse of the logging industry years before. Drugs and other symptoms of despair were all pervading. It's as if the town were being held accountable for Cobain's ruin, which is not entirely unfathomable, wrote Mikhail Gilmore, who visited Aberdeen a week after Kurt's death. When you're confronted with the tragic loss of a suicide, you can't help sorting backward through the dead person's life, looking for those crucial episodes of dissolution that would lead him to such an awful finish. Look far enough into Kurt Cobain's life, and you inevitably end up back in Aberdeen, the homeland that he fled. Okay. All right. Yeah, I'm just glancing over this next page. I'm going to do it without interruption. But first, I must say, that's the whole problem. <clears throat> that's the whole problem is when you... You know, people have been trying to solve this puzzle since 94, well, let's look back to the moment where he must have decided to kill himself. Let's talk about his... You know, with Kurt, it was uh, several things. I mean, this was a tough life. Now, I was going to say his stomach pain, although Buzz Osborne from the Melvins says that Kurt made that up for attention and an excuse to use heroin, the stomach pain. You know, Kurt Cobain's pervasive stomach pain that, you know, he... Stop saying, you know, that was in his... Um lower area of the stomach that he could never quite get diagnosed properly, etc. But let's just assume that that was true. He had stomach pain, heroin addiction, tumultuous relationship, massive international fame. Um, yeah, new baby daughter, 
new marriage, it's like the guy was trying to pile on as much as he could. Which is why uh, his fucking bullshit about, I didn't ask for this. Now, it is two things can be true, you guys. Kurt Cobain was a whiner and he was very talented. If he, you know. So his suicide note was him quitting the music business. He finally took charge of his life for the first time in his life at 27 years old, and he was going to turn it around. Now, maybe he... The the most credible theory is that he was hanging out with some people who fucking gave him a hot shot, which is too much heroin, and then, you know, they killed him. They, they intended to kill him. Stop saying you know. I'm sorry, you guys. I'm just talking to myself because saying you know, no, we don't know, and it's highly insecure. It's a, it's a filler. It's not what a broadcaster should be doing. You know? So he was hanging out with some people who gave him a hot shot and then to make sure that he was dead, killed him. This is the mo- most likely scenario. Was it El Duce and Alan Wrench? Was it people hired by Courtney Love? That is the question. But I feel, it is my opinion, that the situation I just mentioned, the scenario of him being injected too much and then killed with a shotgun just to be sure, I think it's highly likely. I think that is way more likely than him shooting himself up with an overdose amount of heroin. And then just to make sure that he dies, just to make sure I die, I'm going to like kill myself with a shotgun with my big toe. You know, pulling the trigger with my big toe. Have you looked at that shotgun? So the scenario I presented, which is by no means of my imagination, is, you know, these guys I imagine are going to present this in this book as it has been in Soaked in Bleach and these other things that <clears throat> six months ago when I began my examination of Kurt Cobain, I was on the side of disbelief. I was on the skeptical, um, no, I, meaning that I bought the narrative that he killed himself. I hadn't really questioned it. You can go back and listen to those videos. But, and these authors are saying the same thing here. Okay. But the scenario presented in which he is injected with too much heroin and then shot to make sure that he is dead is much more likely than him doing all that stuff to himself. But hey, what do I know? Now we had come to Aberdeen nine years later, seeking a different set of clues. Three hours after our interview with Leland, we stumble upon an unexpectedly rich source of Cobain lore a few miles down the highway. Two women in their early twenties, a stringy-haired boy of seventeen, and a baby. They are loitering outside the bus station when we stop to ask for directions, and we quickly strike up a conversation about Aberdeen's most famous native son. They are too young to have really known Kurt, but we ask them whether they ever listen to his music. Nobody around here listens to that stuff anymore, replies the boy, who could pass for a teenage Kurt minus the distinctive blazing blue eyes. Today he says hip-hop and death metal rule in Aberdeen. They make us an offer we can't pass up. You want to see his house? And then proceed to cram themselves in the car. The baby, wedged between his mother and a skateboard, squirms contentedly in anticipation of whatever adventure lies ahead. Later, we'll bring you to meet one of Kurt's old friends if you want, says Autumn, the 23-year-old mother. She tells us she has two more children at home and then ventures. You're not narcs, are you? As we cruise through the streets of this grim town, passing churches and bars and not much else... It calls forth the description of Kurt's Aberdeen friend Dale Crover, who once said, There's nothing to do here but smoke dope and worship Satan. Is that true? We ask our impromptu tour guides. Pretty much, says the guy. Oh yeah, and also skateboarding. There's also that. The carload of us arrive at a small, impeccably manicured house at 101 East 1st Street in a section of town the locals call The Flats. Kurt's family moved here shortly after his birth from their rented house in nearby Hoquiam. His father, Don, worked as a mechanic at the local Chevron station to support the family while his mother, Wendy, took care of Kurt, born February 20th, 1967, and his sister, Kim, born three years later. Wendy had scrimped and saved Don's earnings to buy the house, 
a badge of respectability heralding arrival into the middle class, and a a decided step up from her own working class roots. She was determined that her children would make something of themselves and eventually escape the dead end that Aberdeen represented for most of the kids who grew up here. And yet Don's father, Leland, never really approved of Wendy, or what he calls her, social climbing ways. I think she thought she was better than our family, he recalls. She was always criticizing Don because he wasn't enough of a muckety-muck. She wanted him to be making more money, and she was never satisfied. Okay. Well, there's some red pill gems there. Kurt's mother... Kurt's mother was... um, She's the modern equivalent of a thought. By all accounts, Kurt's mother was a slut... Um, who was using Don to have kids and then divorce him and then go out and slut it up. Um, You just heard it from Leland. She wanted him to be making more money and she was never satisfied. (laughs) That's all women for you. There you go. Fucking from the mouth of Leland. Aberdeen does not celebrate its status as a cradle of the musical movement called grunge. Indeed, the first thing you notice when you drive through the town looking for indications that a superstar grew up here is that there are none, even in the museum devoted to preserving local history. There's plenty in the museum about the fact that Aberdeen once boasted more than 50 brothels servicing the loggers and sailors, until a wave of morality shut them down in the 1950s. But it's almost as if the locals are embarrassed to claim Cobain as one of their own. We asked the museum's curator, Dan Sears, is the fact... What is this? This is a badly written sentence, you guys. Is the fact that there is not a single mention of Cobain in the Aberdeen Museum of History due to the continuous scorn Kurt heaped on the town? a town whose population he once described as highly bigoted, redneck, snooze-chewing, deer-shooting, faggot-killing logger types. Not at all, Sears replies. It's because my predecessor said he didn't want a bunch of long-haired hippies coming in all the time. He notes that we were the third set of visitors that day asking about Cobain. Just a few minutes earlier, he had fielded a query from a 40-year-old man and his son, who had come a thousand miles to visit Kurt's hometown. Well, so Aberdeen doesn't want to claim Kurt as its own. Um, I, you can imagine that they're pretty burnt out on all this attention um, from the city people about this one kid they considered a faggot one time. Sears does recommend one Kurt-related attraction in Aberdeen that we might want to visit, but even this homage seems to have been treated with a kind of pained embarrassment. Some years earlier, a local truck driver turned sculptor named Randy Hubbard had constructed a 600-pound life-size concrete statue of Cobain in the garage of her husband's muffler shop. I think we all have a little Kurt Cobain in us, explains Hubbard, who knew Kurt when their families lived a block away from one another in Aberdeen. He was a precious little kid when I knew him. As Kurt said, the townspeople of Aberdeen didn't like change or culture. I wanted to put something in the entrance to the town to show the world that some of us loved Kurt. Initially, the Aberdeen City Council had approved her offer to erect the statue in a park at the east entrance of town. But then the angry letters and phone calls from local residents started to pour in, and the town councilors quickly backpedaled. A local Chamber of Commerce president summed up the general feeling. There are lots of people who deserve to be honored, but there's a difference between being famous and being infamous. Today the statue sits tucked in among auto parts and greasy rags. Just as well, Kurt would have never approved. Okay, I gotta interrupt here. So the Aberdeen is ashamed of Kurt because of this because of this fact that he killed himself. Obviously, it's not a fact. That was uh, in air quotes. Imagine if Kurt was murdered, if the Seattle Police Department had actually done their job in 94 on the scene. And yes, there were absolutely political reasons that they so quickly deemed it a suicide, but we will get there. All right. 
they these guys did not want to have anything to do with the fucking grunge rockers. They didn't like them. They didn't. The cops did not like the attention that the grunge rockers brought to Seattle. Seattle started to become a real, even much seedier place filled with heroin um, and just crime. The cops didn't give a fuck about junkies like Kurt. He's dead. Fucking good. Suicide. Piece of shit. Never liked his shitty music anyway. My kids like it. I can't stand that shit. I won't have it in the house. So Aberdeen is ashamed of Kurt Cobain because of this idea, this narrative that he killed himself, which he very likely may not have done. Kurt didn't want to have anything to do with Aberdeen or its residents, as his bandmate Chris Novoselic made clear when he publicly threatened to smash the statue to pieces if it was ever unveiled. If anybody puts up a statue of Kurt, I'll kick it down, Novoselic said in 94. He would not have wanted it. That's not what Kurt was about. A few years later, Hubbard constructed the first sculpture, a statue of a firefighter, to be erected at Ground Zero, after September 11th. But if the town had failed to brag about its most famous native son, it seems that everybody here has some Cobain connection is quite willing to talk about it, as we discovered when the desk clerk of our hotel told us that she had attended kindergarten with Kurt. He was a quiet guy, recalls Bobby Fowler. Kids used to tease him because he was from a poor family. He didn't have the popular stuff other kids had. He struggled because of his mom. That was well known. She didn't treat him good. They didn't have a lot of money, Kurt's family. This didn't quite mesh with the description Kurt gave his official biographer, Michael Azarad, in 1993. I was an extremely happy child, he recalled. I was constantly screaming and singing. I didn't know when to quit. I'd eventually get beaten up by kids because I'd get so excited about wanting to play. I took play very seriously. I was just really happy. From an early age, Kurt had an imaginary friend named Boda, whom he introduced to his family and for whom he made them set an extra place at the table. When five-year-old Kurt was fingered by Aberdeen police as the prime suspect in the torture of a neighbor's cat, Boda was blamed. But, other than a brief period on Ritalin to control his hyperactivity, a condition that was to diminish naturally when his parents restricted his sugar intake, by most accounts, Kurt was a typical... By most accounts, Kurt was a tip... <laughs> Media Gita. Third time's a charm, buddy. By most accounts, Kurt was a typical little boy. That's what it was, you guys. Typical little. Typical little tip... Typical little, typical little, typical... See? Typical little, typical little, typical... See? (laughs) The story goes that the clue to explain what brought this happy childhood to an abrupt crash can be found on a wall inside this house on East 1st Street, where our newfound friends have taken us on the first stop of our Cobain tour of Aberdeen. Here a young Kurt had allegedly scrawled on his bedroom wall, I hate mom... I hate Dad. It really makes me feel so sad. After his parents' relationship started to deteriorate, and he heard them fighting almost constantly. The story, like many told by his mother in later years, may be apocryphal, but has been constantly repeated by chroniclers attempting to explain his self-destructive path, each of whom traces his downward spiral to his parents' 1975 divorce when Kurt was eight. It is the first of a long string of cliches that get trotted out, almost like a mantra, by those seeking pat answers for his eventual fate. Of course his parents' divorce had an effect on Kurt, says his grandfather. What kid isn't affected when their parents split up? But I think the real impact, which I guess you can blame on the divorce, didn't come until a little later. Like almost everybody we talked to in Aberdeen, Leland paints a troubling picture of Kurt's relationship with his mother. She didn't really have much use for him until he became famous. She didn't want anything to do with him. Maybe she couldn't handle him or something, although he really wasn't that much trouble. 
Okay, well, we're going to have to pause. Everybody, from the townspeople to Leland Cobain, uh, they're all saying that Wendy just didn't care about him and she was a shit mother. Do you understand that most mothers care about their children, that the maternal instinct to not care about your, your kids, you have to be really fucked up. You know, it, it is true that men tend to be the ones that don't stick around. Fatherlessness is and has always been, well, that's not true. That's not true, Mita Fatherlessness has really only been a problem since these kind of divorces, 60s and 70s, 1960s and 70s, especially that golden decade of the 1970s where, you know, women's lib and now divorce is okay. You go, girl. Go get yours. All right? The 1970s is when divorce became okay. More so 80s, all right? And definitely 90s. And then it really became like if you didn't get a divorce, if you're a woman, you're not cool. You need to go do your eat, pray, love, and get yours, all right? Get that clit wet. <laughs> By all accounts, from from people who even cared about Wendy, they said she was a shit... Well, what does that entail, being a shit mother, media g Okay. It, it means not being there. Mothers are there for their kids. Mom, I had a bad day. Oh, my God, tell me. Mothers tend to baby their kids. You know, Wendy, I think Kurt reminded her so much of Dawn, who she was never attracted to. If you watch Montage of Heck, she'll say that uh, she got married because it was the, the kind of thing to do. She talk about Dawn Cobain and his underwear. And, fuck, man. You know, and they got married in like the mid 60s. Right. And so if you think that thoughts are a modern phenomenon, women have absolutely always been opportunistic you know, marrying men that they didn't even like because those men were a means to an end, the end being children. Wendy seemed to want it. Well, no, she didn't want children. If you look at Montage of Heck, you know, she said getting married and having kids just seemed like the thing to do. You know, really what we need to, we need to know more about Wendy's father. Sorry, the father came out so loud. But yeah, I mean, obviously, what the fuck is up with your dad? So Wendy Cobain was just a total slut and a terrible mother, all right? And, yeah, a man needs his mother. He does. You talk to your, especially as you become an adult, you talk to your mom like she's your friend. You get to actually kind of become your mom's friend. No, you should not be, listen, parents, you are not your child's friend. But when your child grows up to be 30, 40, 50 years old, they are your friend, and they're going to fucking take care of you when you can't do shit, so you better treat him like your friend. You can have interesting conversations with your mother when you're growing up. It's pretty cool, you know? And that's what Wendy O'Connor really missed out on. That's what she really fucked up. And so in Montage of Heck, she'll go on to take credit for Kurt's success. Oh, and I told him, buddy, you better buckle up because you are not ready. Shut the fuck up. You and Courtney Love make great little snuggle mates. And if you don't get that reference, you will. In the wake of Cobain's suicide, they like slept together. And Courtney was like, oh my God, your blonde hair is like Kurt's blonde hair. And Wendy was like, oh my God, it is. And then they fucking scissored. When Dawn finally moved out of the house shortly after Kurt's ninth birthday, Wendy invited her new boyfriend to move in. Oh, Jesus, here we go. A man Kurt would later describe as a mean, huge wife-beater. Taking on what he perceived to be the father role, the boyfriend would frequently smack Kurt for the smallest transgression. His mother's failure to protect him caused the boy to withdraw into his little world. Wendy later admitted that the man was nuts, but paranoid schizophrenic. At her new boyfriend's suggestion, she soon let Kurt go live with his father, who had taken a small house across the lot from Leland and Iris in Montesano. Well, I just, you know, 
we're wrapping up the video. Typically do these at 55 minutes. It seems to work out. It's a healthy tradition at this point, the 55-minute mark. It makes me happy. It makes you happy. Now, I'll admit we're only, you know, we're not even at Chapter 2 yet, um, but we will get there in the next video. I'm on page... Uh, oh, nice pause, Mijita. I'm on page 9 of Love and Death by Max Wallace and Ian Halperin. Just in case you want to read along or even read ahead and then see what Media g has to say about the uh, so-called suicide of Kurt Cobain. So we will finish chapter one in the next video, and I'll read just a little bit more here. Um, so I'm not, I certainly will not apologize, but I'll admit that this episode, uh, which really, yeah, we'll call this, are we talking video or track Media g yeah, it's a video one of Love and Death by Wallace and Halperin, read by Media Gita. Okay. Uh, well, now what you were gonna what were you gonna say? <laughs> oh, just that I've been talking way too much. But that's the fun of it, you guys. What other channel do you subscribe to that reads you audiobooks and comments on them uh, in an entertaining fashion while you struggle not to kill yourself? All right. I don't know what that has to do with anything. I guess I'm alluding to the fact that um, there's a reason you watch YouTube videos. There's a reason I watch them obsessively and make them. It's because it's highly entertaining. YouTube is way better than cable TV. It's better than Netflix. It's better than any kind of streaming service. Why? You've talked so much shit, Medijita, about how it's full of fucking idiots making videos that you have to turn off. Because there is no censorship. I mean, there is, but if you're small enough, or if you just keep making new channels or whatever, it's too vast. YouTube's the biggest site in the world. It is too vast for them to actually watch these videos. Now, they'll flag it. If this one gets flagged, I'll have to, you know, for content, uh, meaning that they think I stole their audiobook, whatever, then I'll just repost it or I don't know. But it's not going to happen. Never happened before. And so, what was your point, dude? Um... There are real life stakes here. You, YouTube is great, and we make content and we watch content to further the conversation, but also to look into the past now that we have the technology to examine things. Now that we have the distance and the hindsight to go, you know what, this guy killed himself supposedly 25 years ago. And the Seattle Police Department did not do an investigation. There's still a lot of weird things surrounding his death uh, that has a lot of people scratching their heads. Now, some of you guys don't actually care and you're more just watching this for the entertainment aspect and if we're very honest with ourselves sure um it's entertainment in a way because it's fascinating now if someone comes out and solves the mystery once and for all i guess we'll all just have to shut up if they can prove uh, <laughs> if they can that's what it was it was an, am an amalgam of prove and provide if the seattle pd slow down there buddy I know you're excited. I know you're real excited. See, that's the thing, as we're talking about the salacious elements of all this. Because, yeah, it's interesting. We don't want to be murder whores. We want to be detectives who solve murder cases. All right? In the same way that uh, all sorts of shit going on with Casey Anthony and all those murderesses that I did videos on, including Scott Peterson, at the beginning of this channel. There are things about those cases that are weird and that you never heard the first time around. Things that happened 15 years ago, maybe you're not getting the truth on. All right? Truth on! <laughs> Let's see. If Leland has harsh words for his daughter-in-law's treatment of Kurt, he doesn't spare his own son some of the blame. At first, he recalls, Kurt was extremely happy living with Don. They used to go fishing, and they were together all the time. They did all kinds of father and son things. Kurt was thriving. I don't think I'm the only one who noticed he was ecstatic to get away from his mother. And I think Kurt was about the happiest he'd ever been. That soon changed when Don met and married a woman who had two children of her own. Kurt's new stepmother did everything she could to win his affection, but she wasn't the problem. 
One thing I noticed early on after Donnie married this woman was the way he treated Kurt different than her kids, says Leland. They could get away with just about anything, but if Kurt did something wrong, his father would give him a hard time. Donnie never did want the divorce from Wendy, and I think he was afraid that the new one was going to leave him. So he bent over backwards to please her. She had a boy and a girl, and there could have been an apple sitting on a table, and one of her kids could pick up the apple and take a bite out of it and put it back on the table. But if Kurt did that, Donnie would hit him in the head or something. I told Donnie, you're going to lose that kid. I said, God damn it, you got to treat him the same as you do hers. But he denied it, and he said, Bull, I don't treat him any different. I know Kurt resented that. And I think that's when a lot of his problems really began. All right. We're going to wrap it up there. Uh, you know what to do as far as liking, subscribing, commenting, all that. Well, Media Gito, um, this has been a great video. Thank you so much for <laughs> providing it to us. You're, hey, you're welcome. Um, are we going to get another one before Christmas? Uh, I don't know. Only if you're good. Okay, Santa has a list. Santa responds. If you leave me with my dick in the wind, no fucking comments, no nothing, then no, you will not. So, uh, Media Gita, why do you got to be such a gracious host and give us such a great video only to say, well, are you going to say thank you? And uh, you better leave. Yeah, I am. Yes, I am. If you want more, you're going you're gonna to do what you need to do to get more. All right, because I'm fired up. I'm fired up about this stuff. Talking about Kurt Cobain, for some reason, unable to get out of an accent. And also, how come you're using a Texas accent for Leland Cobain? Listen, man, I don't make the rules around here. You know, I just do what the voices tell me to do. So, no, seriously, go seriously, folks. I want to thank you for, yeah. We're all great. Oh, we're all grateful and happy, Media G Tao. Thank no, thank you. No, Merry Christmas to you. No, me, you. No, everyone have a no, you have a Merry. Shut up. Too many good feelings. All right. I appreciate you listening. And I'm uh, I have a feeling you like this one because I'm in a good mood today. And we're talking about a new subject. Now I had said I had said I am done. I am done with Cobain, you guys. I've done eight to ten videos on this. I've examined the man's life more than one could. The Kennedy assassination or something. Yeah, but much like Wallace and Halperin, you were looking at the wrong things. And you were looking at the wrong things just based on what was available to you at the time. Now this book, let's check the copyright date. 2004. So this is still 15 years ago. Oh, in memory of Kristen pa uh, Pfaff, she was the bassist for Hole, who was also probably killed. So, it's not new information, okay? But it is important, and it's also compelling. The way this book is written, it's easy to read. Even though I, I stumble sometimes, um, it's well written. So, I've run out of steam, you guys. Will I be back before Christmas? It depends on whether or not you are good little children. This has been Media Gita saying Merry Christmas.